Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Cutting Edge Figure Skating Podcast. My name is Kim Dunaway, and in this episode, I'll be doing a little bit of bonus coverage, talking about Gracie Gold's latest memoir, Out of Shape, Worthless Loser. So before I get into the spoilery of it all, let me just take a couple of minutes for those of you maybe that have not read the book yet. I highly, highly recommend it. I'm a pretty avid reader. I read most of my nonfiction books, listen to them via audio on Audible, and then read most of my fiction books, the physical copy. But every now and then I switch it up. And so for this one, I read the physical copy copy of this book. I didn't want to miss anything by zoning out for a second, listening to the audiobook, which I'm sure is also really good. And I might get that at some point also. But if you haven't read the book, you're not a big reader, of course, you can always do the audio and that would still help to support Gracie in this very important memoir. And if you are a lover of figure skating, I think you would find this book really, really interesting. And I personally have read a few other figure skating books, Christine Bitt Brennan's book, The Second Mark, and it's always great to get those inside looks into the world of figure skating. But what's so fantastic about this book is you get to hear it from the source. Now, Gracie, from my understanding, according to Phil Hirsch, has a ghostwriter for this, but it still comes out very much as authentically her. And they do such a good job with navigating through some really tough times for her. I think it's extremely relatable. I know that there are thoughts about potential triggers and I am no mental health professional. And so obviously this book is going to address depression big time for her. There's a rape in there. Although I will say it is in far less detail than what we've seen in some of the, the latest safe sport reports that have come out. So it's not, it's not really not very graphic, but that still doesn't mean that it might not be triggering for someone who has experienced something similarly. And I think the biggest trigger might be the John Coughlin chapter, just because it's it's so different than what we probably remember, which is those allegations with safe sport right before he committed suicide. And so if you're a survivor of that or a friend of a survivor of that, that might be a tough chapter, although you could skip the chapter as well. But I do think that it's a really, really fascinating chapter and um, look forward to talking about that. So I just wanted to say, if you haven't read the book, definitely I encourage you to read it or listen to it. And yeah, all right, let me get into the, the spoilery of it. So the book is broken down into four parts. So you've got part one, which is Grace Elizabeth, which is really sort of about her growing up, her family life, which really lays the foundation for what really starts to go awry post-2016. And then you've got part two, which is Gracie Gold, which really sort of takes up when she moves to training with Frank Carroll in the 2013-2014 season and goes up into the point when Frank Carroll basically dumps her as a coach. Um, right before then, when is part three is out of shape, worthless loser. And that sort of picks up right after the world championships in 2016. And then part four is what she titles me. And that is really post treatment. So it's broken up really well. And so if I just I think the easiest way for me to approach this is sort of to go by by the parts that she laid out in the book. And so what really stood out to me in part one was obviously the family dynamic, but with her and her parents, she talks about in the book. So she's got a twin sister, Carly. Her mother had a lot of fertility issues, ultimately did in vitro treatments, and she was pregnant with Gracie and Carly at age 41. And so they basically were like miracle babies, but even before they were brought into this earth, her father had a prescription drug addiction issue. He was an anesthesiologist, is an anesthesiologist still, I would imagine. And so he was a doctor, the mom was a nurse, I believe that's how they met. And so 
before Gracie and Carly even came into this world, it was addiction that he was already dealing with. And so it would be a number of years after they were born before they would ever find out any of these different types of secrets with their father. But it created a very volatile situation when she was growing up. She talks about remembering her dad oftentimes would be yelling at them and at other times would be giving them candy bars. And the mom also had a very sort of volatile relationship um, as well with them. And then also they didn't really notice as much that her parents had a lot of marital issues and their father had a lot of affairs and was always stepping out on their mother. So she talks about early in the book about how they went to, I believe it was Cancun when her and Carly were seven. And it was the last time that she could remember them taking a trip as a family that wasn't skated related. And that she remembers that everybody was so happy at that particular vacation. And even leading up to that, there were issues that she could recall, but she remembered that moment where everybody was happy and nobody was yelling at each other. So in terms of her skating, it's been this, this sort of crafted narrative with Gracie for a number of years that she started skating at a birthday party and that would made her want to be a figure skater. And she said that that's not entirely accurate because what she really wanted to do after the birthday party was take hockey lessons. <laughs> and her mother was like, no, because she said she was very much a tomboy and that her mother sort of wanted her to do something a little bit more girly. And so she instead decided to put her and Carly in figure skating lessons. And so they, she being Gracie picked up things very, very quickly, just had a natural athletic ability and pretty quickly outgrew her coaches locally to them in Missouri. So they started going on Fridays, 300 miles from Missouri to Springfield, Illinois, which is like a five, six hour drive, right? And she called this coach Cruella. And she obviously didn't like her very much, but they she made a lot of leaps as a skater there. And then she sort of grew out her as well too. And ultimately ends up in Chicago with Alex. And she talks about in the book that she, she thought it was a bit strange at the time that they would spend all this time away from her dad. And, but now that she understands that, you know, her mother craved that space away from their father. And so she talks about, you know, some of the earliest success that she got was in 2010 at the U.S. Championships that she was fourth in novice. And at that point, she, pretty much everybody on the podium inside the, the top 10 was homeschooled and her and Carly were still attending classes regularly, having a very normal life. And so they made the decision at that point to shift, start to take classes online instead as a way to sort of be able to devote more time to skating. And she said her skating actually got worse, which I think is already, you're starting to see like that red flag, like as her social life or home life starts to crumble, it really affects her on the ice and understandably so. And so she actually doesn't qualify for the 2011 championships at the junior level. And so at that point, her and their family made the decision where they were training with Alex in Chicago, driving 200 miles from, which was a little bit closer than Springfield, Illinois was, but still quite the journey. And so they made the decision to stop driving up there part-time to work with Alex, but to move to Chicago to train with him on a more permanent basis. And so they left their dad in Missouri and her and Carly and mom moved into an apartment in Chicago, which is not unlike what you see from other Olympic type of skaters, gymnasts. There's usually certain pockets of coaches and Oftentimes, when you get to that point, when you've outgrown your coaches, you're going to have to move. I remember like with Tara Lipinski, I think they're from Texas and her and her mother had to move to Michigan to train with Richard Callahan and the dad stayed behind. So that wasn't uncommon. A lot of times you're not going to uproot everybody because you've got a staple figure who's got a job, who's got to stay where they are. 
And so this is how she starts working with, with Alex on a more permanent basis, full time. And this was the coach that really molded her into Gracie Gold, into the skater that she would become. And she talks about how early he expressed a lot of really genuine interest in her. And he would ask about her family and they had a very good working relationship. But as Gracie started to have more success and the expectations grew higher for her, that she felt like he sort of saw her as his golden ticket. And he really upped his intensity. He would start body shaming her a lot, talk about her her, her fat butt a lot of times. He really sort of resorted to some of his Russian tendencies. So he's a Ukrainian figure skating coach. She gives him kudos for being a great jump coach, great technical jump coach. But he would oftentimes do things like step on their abdomen region when they were holding boat pose, he would make Gracie do really extra run throughs and practices. And he would make her do things. And if she didn't do it right, he he would make all of the other, other skaters have to run laps. And so Gracie felt a lot of pressure because if she didn't do something well, it affected all the other skaters in that practice session. And that's a lot of pressure and a very unnecessary, right? And then at the same time, she was starting to have some body image issues because she was going through puberty and she was developing. All of a sudden, you got a little bit of extra weight and you feel the need to get it off very quickly. Her mother, who she talks about in part one, basically, as probably having disordered eating herself. She would eat a few bites and then she would push her food away and say she wasn't hungry anymore. She started to weigh Gracie and Carly. And Gracie says, you know, in the book that, while that sounds like a horrible thing, but she's also trying to get to the Olympics because at this point in 2013, Gracie goes to her first U.S. nationals and seniors and she's expected to do well. She ends up ninth in the short program. And looks like all is lost, goes out and skate lights out in the free skate to finish second overall, go to Worlds, where she finishes sixth in her first Worlds, which is amazing. And so, but so what she's saying in that is like, yes, it's, it's terrible on one hand that my mother was weighing us and, and berating us if she would find a a chocolate bar wrapper. But at the same time, like I'm trying to reach this nearly impossible dream of getting to the Olympics. And what, what would be normal for most families can't be normal for us. And so you can sort of understand it, but what happens is she develops some really unhealthy eating habits. And that's that sometimes that she would only have coffee and three tomatoes in one day with hours of practice and conditioning which is of course just not healthy. And she talks about, you know, especially once she gets to Frank over in part two, that, you know, at times that she would be at her most unhealthiest eating wise. And that's when people would tell her that she looked the best and the most fit, which just continues to perpetuate the disordered eating. So her relationship with Alex really, really starts to deteriorate. He would oftentimes show up to the rink drunk And she didn't even know at times, she said in the book that she thought that he had this interesting cologne. And then years later, she smelled cognac and she was like, oh my God, that's what he smelled like, (laughs) you know? And so he was just, you know, completely unprofessional in a lot of ways. They had a very volatile relationship, complete screaming matches. And it all sort of came to a head one day on Gracie and Carly's birthday. And the mother had brought some cake And all of the other skaters, including Carly, were allowed to go eat the cake except Gracie. Gracie still had to stay and work on whatever it was Alex wanted her to work on. And then when she was done and she wanted to go eat the cake, he blew up and had a huge fit. of She can't have cake. And so then it made them almost late to some kind of excursion that they were going on. And it just kind of blew up. And she was like, I I can't do this anymore. Either I get a new coach or I'm going to stop skating. Like, I just can't do it. And she says in the book, Like I, there would be no Olympics without Alex, but I would have not made it to the Olympics with Alex, like something had to give. And so in the summer of 2013, she shows up at Champs Camp, basically. She 
she refers to it as something else, but it's like the 2013 version of Champs Camp. And she shows up without her coach. And U.S. figure skating is not happy. They're like, what are you doing? Can you not work it out? It's an Olympic season. Can you just make it work through this season? And she's like, absolutely not. So she says, Marina Zueva and Oleg Epstein, who of course were there with Meryl Davis and Charlie White, would accompany her to the ring. And they really took her in and she trained there after she left Champs Camp until she had another option. And she was always very complimentary of them throughout the book because she has another stint there later in her career after she leaves Frank Carroll. So there is a U.S. figure skating official named Scott Brown who arranged a two-week trial with Frank Carroll for Gracie. And the what she says in the book is Frank Carroll basically wanted nothing to do with her, that he felt like she was high maintenance, but she really needed this. So she showed up in California on her best behavior and the two week trial turned into a marriage that lasted up through the 2017 U S figure skating championship. So once you get into this, this is when you get into to part two or the grace, what she calls the Gracie gold part, which she feels like is a persona. It was this ice princess persona that they continue to show this, with this lovely Midwestern family, everything is perfect. She has, you know, everything that anybody could ever want. She's got everything. She's got the looks, she's got the skills. And that this was sort of the narrative that was shaped for her going into the 2014 Olympics. Of course, at that point, she hadn't won a national title. She hadn't had a lot of international success really, but that the U S media, especially in BC and those types were really, really hungry for a contender for women skating. Because if you look back, there had been just a tremendous amount of success in women skating. Going back to, you know, 68 and Peggy Fleming, and you've got Dorothy Hamill in 76 and Linda Fracciani in 80 and Rosalind Summers in 84 and Debbie Thomas in 88 and Christy Yamaguchi and Nancy Kerrigan in 92 and Nancy Kerrigan again in 94 and Michelle and Tara in 98 and Michelle and Sarah in 2002 and Sasha in 2006. So you had this long, long stream of U.S. ladies who really dominated figure skating for such a long time before IJS. And then you have the 2010 Olympics and there was no medalist. Mariah ended up fourth at that, but of course she ultimately doesn't end up qualifying for the 2014 team. And so they're really, really hungry for someone. And they sort of take Gracie and put her on the podium as the next great American figure skater. And so she started to feel quite a bit of pressure from that. Now, obviously she goes on to the Olympics. They win a bronze in the first Olympic team event. And she ends up fourth at the Olympics, which is amazing for an Olympic debut in what is only her second senior season. But she says in the book that fourth is the loneliest number. Like she would have rather been fifth or sixth because fourth, it's like you're so close. Now, forget the fact that she's behind Yuna Kim and Carolina Costner, that Mayo Asada was also at that same Olympics. So those came in really as the three favorites. Of course, we know Adelina Sotnikova came out of nowhere to win the whole thing. But there she was right there. And while it should have been celebrated as this really great accomplishment, she says that it really came across more so as a failure. And that's sort of the way that she framed it at that time, unfortunately so. And she even talks later in the book about the what if scenario. We know at this point, because just in the last few months, it came out that Adelina Adelina Sonikova actually failed a drug test, but that her B sample was clean. But she even talks about in the book, like, In the alternate reality where Sunikova is disqualified and she was bronze, does that make her life better or does it make it worse, right? I mean, on the surface, you'd be like, oh my gosh, Gracie Gold bronze medalist could have been huge for her career, right? But on the other hand, does it necessarily prevent the spiral that ensued? Does it potentially make it worse? Like you don't know. And so later in the book, I think she frames it really, really well in that she's, she's okay with the fourth place finish now because she doesn't know that the third place finish would have made her life any better. But it's always an interesting conversation to have because there are those rumors, 
just the unsettledness that you have about that entire competition in general. But even so, in the outset of that, it's not really where things fell apart for her, even though there was some disappointment with her results. Of course, Gracie goes on to win another national title. So her and Ashley basically swap titles. Ashley wins in 2013, Gracie is second. Gracie wins in 2014. Ashley wins in 2015. Gracie wins in 2016. And what is, it will always be her best performance of that Firebird free skate at the 2016 U.S. Nationals. And she even talks about how Frank says it's the, one of the best performances, if not the best performance of any of his skaters that he could ever really remember. Um, only because when Michelle skated that flawless Lilla, Hitler Angelica program at the 98 U.S. Nationals. Oh, no, no. Oh, her and Frank were still together. I'm thinking about 2002. Okay, no, I disagree. Nothing beats Michelle's 98 U.S. Nationals performance. But that was a fantastic performance from Gracie. I remember watching it on my couch at home being just so excited with that because we knew we had a Boston home world coming up in 2016. But what's going on while she's sk skating this amazing routine and while she's working up to this home world champions in 2016 is her home life is totally falling apart. And and of course, her disordered eating is also very much at its peak. And so on the surface, things looked great. Things look like this, this coaching situation with Frank is working and it's working really well and she's fit. And But in reality, she had disordered eating. She always, she, she, she's very complimentary of Frank in the book because I really thought that she was just going to totally throw Frank under the bus in this book. And that's not the case at all. But what she does say is it was really all business with Frank, that there was no really getting to know her. And she always sort of blamed Christopher Bowman in the book as a reason for this. Christopher Bowman was this fantastically talented skater in the 80s. And Frank Carroll was his coach, but he had a drug addiction, ultimately died of a drug overdose years later. And so he felt like Gracie felt like that Frank was so close to Chris Bowman and there was nothing that he could do about his drug addiction that with other skaters that he was, he just would not allow himself to get that close. It's, it's a very interesting observation. I have no idea. Like when I think about Christine Brennan's book about the lead up to the 98 Olympics, you know, Michelle and Frank's relationship was always sort of presented as this really amazing package. And, and I can't imagine that Frank was very on the surface with Michelle, but I, I don't know, you know, Michelle is, has never been one to write books or do a lot of, you know, interviews post her career to really talk about that relationship as much. And I have no idea either what his relationship was with Evan Lysacek. And so, but she does say later in the book when, she, when Dennis 10 tragically passed that she knew how close they were. And so she even took that opportunity to, to send him a text message about that so I, I don't know that I completely buy the theory that he was on that on that same level with everybody. I, I just kind of think that the circumstances in which they came together was a bit more like business. I mean, she's coming in in an Olympic season. We've got to get right to work. And he made a lot of different you know changes to her packaging and things like that that she also credits as well. But as things start to really spiral out of control, and Frank does try to reach out to her, like what's going on. She said she would just always say nothing. So she she says that, you know, yes, he, he wasn't like Alex and that he wasn't trying to get to know me and ask me about other things in my life. But when the, the shit hit the fan, that he did try to reach out and she just didn't let him. And so I, I thought it was interesting that, she really doesn't blame Frank at all for, for the de demise that she, it's really more the family life. Like at this point that things are just in the tank with her parents 
and that you, the tension is just palpable. And it was it would almost be better if her father didn't come to different competitions because he came to Boston World and they went out like as a as a family to dinner. And it just really sort of the whole situation just really sort of got in her head. And so, of course, we famously at Boston Worlds in 2016, she won the short program, which was huge, amazing. It's home worlds. At this point, it had been 10 years since a U.S. lady had medaled at the world championships. Kimmy Meisner won the world title in 2006 and Sasha got bronze. And it had been a 10 year drought since then. And had, after years and years of always having at least one person, if not two people on the podium. And so there was a lot of pressure on both Gracie and Ashley, like one of you, please get on the podium, right? So this particular world championships is the the first of two that Evgenia Medvedeva won. And so she talks about kind of listening in the background of like everybody sort of skating really well. Evgenia just skated really well. The other Russian, Anna, skated really well. And you know, she gets out there and just doesn't have a, a good skate. It just wasn't what she wanted. She very much wanted to to duplicate that moment that she had at nationals and it just didn't happen. And once again, she ends up fourth. And it was her second fourth place finish. So she had been sixth in 2013, fifth in 2014, fourth in 2015, and fourth again this year. And so, and it just, for all of us that watched, The Gracie that that we had been been accustomed to watching was basically over at that point, right? We didn't know it at the time. She was obviously she was so so devastated in that kiss and cry, and so self deprecating in the interviews after. But of course, nobody knew really until this book came out what was going on with her emotionally, with her eating, with her family life. We've we've always asked that question. Like what happened after the 2016 world? Was it the finish of the 2016 world or was it something else? And what what this book finally gives us that peek into is that the family life was just really a a mess for her. And she just got to a point emotionally where she just couldn't deal with it anymore. And early in her career before she moved to California. She had a sports psychologist that she worked with and that really seemed to help her. But there's no mention of her once she gets to California. So she must have been somebody local in Missouri or, or someone that, that that she worked with before they moved to Chicago or in Chicago. E- either way it was, there's no mention of her in the book. And so it, it seems like she went through quite a period of time where she didn't have any body in her life that she could really talk to that up until I think 2016 Carly had always skated with her and at that point that she had left and moved on to college and so part of her support system was gone her mother at this particular point in time started drinking really really heavily and so she just didn't have anybody to lean on and then her coach Frank Carroll was just very much all business on the surface. And, and so that was really a big part of her downfall. And even with the disordered eating, I, you know, a lot of people didn't feel like she was thin enough to really have a disorder, which is absurd. You know, most people, I I never talk about myself on the podcast, but um, I have two degrees in nutrition and most people that have a eating disorder are not underweight. It's a very, very small portion of people that are underweight. And that doesn't mean that a person doesn't have an eating disorder. And so there were so many red flags at the time and nobody, nobody picked up on them. And yes, Gracie could have reached out for help, but when you're so deep into the abyss, that's an almost impossible task for someone in her position to have been able to do. So part three picks up after the world championships in 2016 and what she calls out of shape, worthless loser and where she really starts to descend into depression. And she went from eating <clears throat> three tomatoes a day or three apples a day to consuming as much as two pizzas at a time in one sitting. 
that she went from more of an anorexia to more of a binge eating type of disorder situation. And so she gained 20 pounds or so. And so when she shows up at, you know, Jamps Camp Scamp in 2016, everybody's like, what's, you know, kind of what's happened to Gracie? And, and so again, nobody is, is really trying to dig into what could be underneath the surface at all. And it's more of like, well, you know, l- let me just get this weight off so that I can get my jumps around and everything will be fine. That was sort of her, her feeling. And just a lot of really poor decisions were made in that 2016, 2017 season. She was clearly spiraling. Nobody really seemed to notice, even herself, just sort of kind of think, well, if I just go to this competition and do well, everything will be fine. If I just go out and do this, everything will be fine. If I lose this weight, everything will be fine. And that was just sort of the whole feeling leading up to the 2017 nationals. And I think Frank at this point was very frustrated because he felt like he wasn't getting through to Gracie and wanted her to go back to Alex for a time before nationals it, that, that what he was saying wasn't working and maybe she would listen to him and the 2017 nationals happen and she ends up six. And so she's not picked for the world team despite having done well at the worlds prior to it, but she hadn't had a good season leading up to it. And things with her and Frank just boiled basically out of control. He ends up throwing her team jacket into the trash and saying, my work here is done. And he released a statement saying that they had parted ways and she found out through other channels, not from Frank, that he was no longer working with her. So not a good breakup at all. And so the thought was at that point, okay, well, I'm just, I'm going to go back to Alex, even though we had this very horrible, volatile relationship on the end, this is going to be the best decision for me going forward. So she goes back to Chicago and Alex never shows up. She does this for several days, shows up at the rink and every day he doesn't show up. Why? We're not giving any explanation for super strange. Is he drunk? Does he not want to? I don't know. It's super crazy because she talks about in the beginning book when he sort of saw her as his golden ticket as a way to raise his rates and raise his profile, they sort of descended into this this madness, right? And so here's your opportunity again to rehabilitate your former skater and he just ghosted her basically. And so now she's again without a home. So she ends up back at Detroit again with Marina and Oleg training there, comes to Champs Camp in 2017. Again, she's away from her sister in Detroit and things continue to descend for her and she starts binge eating again. She puts on even more weight and shows up at camp, Champs Camp in 2017. And they're like, what is, what is going on? And she has a, she's really not in any shape to be there emotionally don't know that she's been skating a lot at that point either, because a lot of days that she was just like in bed for like days at a time, kind of a deal. And of course, again, she's living alone. Her mom's not there. Her sister's not there. Doesn't have coaches that are attached to her necessarily, you know, who's really checking on her to make sure that she's, you know, bathing and eating and taking care of herself. And so she has a very poor performance at champs camp and just unloads on the officials there. And they're all under the impression this entitled spoiled brat. And at this point, Gracie admits that she's had some suicidal thoughts. And so she ends up in the kitchen trying to find something to eat. And she runs into, I think it's a team, the U S figure skating dietitian. And I think that there's also a team doctor that's in there and they're like, they just ask her, you know, hey, Gracie, just like what's going on? And she just unloads about what's been going on with her parents and all of these different things. And they're like, Gracie, you are depressed. You need to get some help. And they start the ball rolling them. I think there's a, a team trainer named Brandon who's also involved. And ultimately, Gracie ends up at the Meadows in Arizona for six weeks of treatment. And she said 
basically U.S. figure skating paid the bills about fifty thousand dollars, and which is great. And that she started there going, "What am I doing here? I have nothing in common with these people." And after a few days, and she's like, "Finally, some people that are thinking like me and understand me." And so at that point, she's taking a break from from figure skating and. This is an Olympic season. This is the 2017-2018 season leading up to Pyeongchang, which four years prior, two years prior, Gracie was considered a a lock for that, right? But now she's on the outside looking in. And it was a, a difficult decision for her to even go to treatment because it's like, here I am in the throes of an Olympic season. I need to be on the ice. And and it was at that point that she writes this letter to skating, which is how the book starts off. It, it bookends with letters to skating. It, the first one is the one that she wrote at the Meadows in September 2017. And the last one is what she writes after all of this is said and done, including her comeback. The first one here at this point in her career is very much the heartache of what skating has done to me. Now, she basically was no longer in love with it. Look what it has done. I, I wish I never met you kind of a thing. And then the last letter that she writes at the end of the book is completely different. But where she was at at this particular point in time was she was just in a in a state of extreme depression and skating was very much the catalyst to that. It, it was an escape for at some point, but then it just kind of caught up with it and she couldn't, she couldn't really separate the two, right? And so she spent this time in treatment, which means she wasn't going to be on the ice, which means she was going to be sort of behind the eight ball and trying to qualify for nationals. And if she didn't go to an international event, then she was going to have to go through the channels of competing at regionals and sectionals and all of that as if she were a brand new senior skater. And she didn't want to go through those channels. So she chose to take a... Grand Prix assignment at Rust Telecom later that season. And she knew that she wasn't ready to do it, but she went anyway, had a terrible short program and ultimately withdrew after the short program. And it was kind of at that point that she was like, the Olympics isn't going to happen. Like I'm going to have to take an extended break from skating. And it's really where part four picks up, which is the part that she had she titles me, which is her post treatment, trying to navigate how to cope, how, if she wanted to skate again, what that would look like. And ultimately what she sort of decided with the quote unquote comeback was that she didn't want to wonder what could have happened if she didn't go back that that shoulda coulda woulda can be so powerful they say you know at the end of the life it's the things that you don't do that you regret not the things that you did do and so gracie decides that she is gonna make a comeback and so she gets this this great opportunity from these coaches in philadelphia which i remember when she came back at the time we're like gracie's this high profile skater yes she's She's been out of commission for about a year and a half, but you know, who was this, who are these people? Like who was Pavel and, and Alex and these people that she's, that she's training with and they would post videos with her in the harness and all these kind of things. Are they trying to be famous? But she, I think she really clears up a lot of that in the book that they were like saviors for her because she, you know, she, she's running out of money at this point and you know, what endorsements that she, you know, had, and, you know, she had not been competing and, and winning prize money. And so they, they offered her basically to train her for free in, in exchange for her coaching a little bit. And, and that's really where it started. You know, she started just like she said, when she got her double axle back, she was like, okay, I think I can do this. Like, I think I can do this. And eventually the triples came back and that she had planned to compete at the 2019 world, world, no, the 2019 nationals. But she ultimately decided not to. But in between there and then is when you get this very interesting chapter, surprising chapter for me, on her relationship with John Coughlin. 
So chapter 17 is titled The Heartache of It Ending Before It Even Begins. So John Coughlin reaches out to Gracie in I think post 2018 nationals. But like I just mentioned, Gracie did not attend because he felt like she was very down from not being able to get on the Olympics, missing most of the season. And so he pitches to her this idea of them traveling around and doing skating clinics. And so people might ask, how on earth do her and John Coughlin know each other? Well, of course, the skating world is a small community. And they were on the 2014 Olympic team together. He was the Piggers representation representative. So they come up with, he pitches this idea to her. She agrees to go on what they call Roll to Gold, which still goes on obviously now with Gracie and a, another skater named Jeffrey Varner is, is who is, is with her this, this year in 2024. But I just, I found a press clipping from, from 2018. And this was something I wasn't super privy to at the time, because I think it, you just, it, it felt like Gracie sort of fell off the face of the earth there for a minute. And so it didn't really know what was going on with her. And so this particular press clipping is from March of 2018. Olympic bronze medalist Gracie Gold and former U.S. Pairs champion John Coughlin discussed spin techniques with participants at the two-day Road to Gold training camp last year at the Line Creek Ice Arena. Organized by Coughlin, the clinic offered participants a chance to learn championship-level practices and techniques. Dreams of Olympic gold became bright earlier this month for 40 young figure skaters from the Kansas City area during the two-day Road to Gold training camp at the Line Creek Ice Arena in Kansas City, Missouri. Led by Olympic medalist Gracie Gold and former U.S. Pair champion John Coughlin, the clinic offered several workshops that allowed participants to learn championship-level practice drills and technique. For many of the skaters, gold has been an inspiration as they devote years to chasing their own dreams. So the opportunity to work with her was a dream come true. So this was in early March of 2018. And so her and John traveled around the country doing these clinics. And as a result, they became very close. They would have long conversations at night. They would often share hotel rooms, which Gracie says at the end of the chapter, their relationship was never anything more than platonic. But she first became to really value him as a friend. But at some point, I don't know if it was while her and John were working together or, or after he had passed on, she realized she was in love with him and really wanted to spend the rest of her life with him. And so it's a very interesting chapter, knowing what we know now about him. And while they're on this, these clinics, is when the Safe Sport report comes out about him, where ultimately four female figure skaters came forward and accused him of different levels of sexual harassment, sexual assaults. And so she saw the report before John brought it up and she wanted him to bring it up, which he which he did. She didn't have to prompt him. And I think there were some mixed feelings, but at that point she was so emotionally wrapped up in her relationship with him that she couldn't really resolve the allegations versus their, their relationship. And that originally she had planned to compete at 2019 nationals and ultimately she withdrew so that she wasn't going to go. And like a week before nationals, she had planned to travel from Philadelphia to, I believe it was Missouri, I think that's where he was, to see him. And he was like, no, don't do it. It's, it's, it, don't spare the expense. Like it's, it's, you know, um, I'm fine. And she regrets very much not doing that because the following weekend he took his life. And he left her a letter. So, she was at the movies, like she was, she was doing something at the movies. Um, I can't remember if she was with Carly or with another friend, but when she got, when some point she realized her phone had just blown up because I mean, she's at the movies, it's on silent, you know, I think her phone blew up and I think she had a message from John's sister and she knew something, she knew something was awry because of all the messages. And then she got the message from John's sister 
that he was gone and was just, of course, she was devastated. But he had written her a letter, like, before he offed himself. And her sister ultimately gave it to Gracie and she, she, the letter is in the book. Like she shared the letter in the book. And obviously for her, this is extremely heartbreaking. And as someone reading this book, it's, it's always very interesting to have sort of one picture of a person and then sort of get another perspective of a person. And, and Gracie, even in the, in the writing of this book is still sort of wrestling with those feelings of, is what I felt not real? Did I, did I miss this? You know, is this person a predator, you know, or, 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 or was he innocent of these things? I, I, we don't know because they ultimately closed the case upon his death, which everybody at the time felt like was a, a huge misstep. Like you should keep the case open so she she has sort of these unresolved feelings in this way because she had this man that she thought that she was literally going to marry. Um, that's how involved that she was, you know, with with this person. And and now you have these allegations that come out. And I think, and she says that you know both things can be true. Like this person could have been a really important and great friend to me, and could have also done these horrible things to other people. And and I think it's it's not unlike what we see at times with sexual assaults and other things that they're, they're usually not assaulting everybody in their path, right? There's certain people, you know, be it they have a certain type or be it they're under the influence. I don't know, but, and, and that's what can be hard for people to resolve at times. Like I know this person, I, I don't know this other person. And then the victim is saying, well, I only know this other person. I don't know the person that you know. And so it's a, it's a really interesting chapter. And I had no idea that they were that close. Zero idea. She still does these Road to Gold clinics today, like I mentioned with another skater. And, and, and she mentioned it was so enormously helpful for her in her path to recovery and to, in her path to be able to discover the love of skating again. But I think that you, for her, you, you also have on this hand the, the person that took the way out that she had once considered for herself and, but she was choosing to live like, you know, and it, it became part of her recovery and, 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 but Gracie every day makes that decision to continue to live. So obviously after the 2019 season, the 2020 season is a season ultimately where Gracie makes her comeback. And she talks a lot about the media at different times. She really hammers on Tara and Johnny a lot in the the early part of the book when she was trying to make her come back. When, not when she was trying to make her come back, when she was starting to spiral out of control. And the, the comments that they made, she felt like were just so tone deaf and, you know, that she needs to get in shape, she needs to suck it up, and all of these different types of things for what she was going through. She was, of course, extremely depressed eating disorders. And she's like, how can Tara even identify with what I'm going with? She retired when she was 15. And here I am with a woman's body, like trying to make this work, like have some compassion. And then on the other hand, when she comes back and does her, her comeback, they're making all these flowery comments about how great it is that she's back and what a huge win it is for her. And she's like, well, do you feel like you can't like critique me at all because, you know, I was 12th and, you know, I could be better. So I I feel like she never got from the commentators what she kind of really wanted. She wanted like more compassion when she was going through all of those, those tough times, you know, 2016, 2017. And then she wanted maybe a little bit more critique when she came back for her comeback. But it, it was when I, when I watched the 2020 nationals, I remember posting on Twitter and basically people just like eh, um, that I was, I was, I was happy to have Gracie back, but I, but there was, there was a part of me that was disappointed that she didn't skate well because she had skated well in a lot of the practices leading up to it. It's one of the things I love about nationals and skate America is you get to watch the practice cams and she does really, really nice triple, triple combinations and really nice jumps. And when she got into the competition itself, it just kind of wasn't there, which you could, understand. I mean, she had gone through sectionals and regionals and all that to get there, 
but she definitely had been out of competition for such a long time. And the last time we'd really seen her was in the 2017, 2018 season, that one time for that one short program. And so she ended up 12th and but you felt like, okay, she could, there's some bones here. Like she could build on this. And then of course COVID happened and, you know, she spelt, spent, you know, some time off the ice because of that. And then she had the domestic skate America that year that she also didn't do particularly well. And I think she was last. And so going into the 2021 nationals, again, you're still just like hoping that you see some signs of Gracie out of what you kind of see at her in practice. And it was kind of very much the same. And I remember thinking, okay, year from now, I just want to see Gracie skate clean one time. Like, that's all I want. I, I may have even said that in the one podcast that I recorded after that Domestic Skate America. It's like, I just want to see Gracie have like just one moment. What she did at the 2022 Nationals in Nashville, she had that great short program with the East of Eating program, and she was in that final group. Uh, she was six. But then going into the free skate, she was fifth because Alyssa had to withdraw because of she tested positive for COVID. And she expressed frustration in the book that nobody was really taking her seriously as a potential person that could make the Olympic team. Now, of course, Gracie didn't have tech minimums at this point because she hadn't been in, I don't know, she hadn't been in an international competition at all. Because I'm thinking maybe in the fall of 21, they sent her to Nebelhorn. I, I can't, I can't entirely remember. Um, but she just didn't do well. Okay, so 21-22 season, she was 13th at Cranberry Cup. So she wasn't an in international, but she didn't get her tech minimums for that. So it would have been difficult for her had she just like blown the doors off the place and, and made them consider putting her on the Olympic team. But really, I mean, Mariah, Karen Chin, Alyssa Liu was really who you expected to be on there. You thought maybe there could have been an outside chance for Amber Glenn, who unfortunately also had to retire, had to withdraw at that championships, but you really couldn't see the path for Gracie, but she expressed some, some discontent in the book that people didn't really seem to take her seriously for that. But unfortunately at, at nationals, she didn't have the best free skate. And she said, she felt like she got maybe in a little bit of her head and that maybe she thought that she could get back and, and have that moment where she made it back. And so she ended up 10th, which was her best, finish of the comeback. She had been 12th in 2020 and 13th in 2021. And she had that great short program. It just didn't quite all come together. And so she decided to continue on. She did another season. And that fall, she was at Skate America and had a, a very similar short program. She kept the short program. And then again, not a great free skate, but she ended up six, which was the best finish that she had had at a major international like that. She had been third earlier that season that she talks about in the book at Philadelphia behind, like, I think it was Lindsay Thorngren and somebody else. But, um, but anyway, so, but you know, yet she gets to the championships again and she finishes eighth. And so again, it ended up being her best finish of, of all of them. But it just never, never, the free skate just never came together for Gracie. And, and it was kind of an ironic because she kind of felt like and early in her career, like the free skate was her jam. Like she didn't always have the great short program, but she would be the comeback kid and have this great free skate. And, and the free skate just never really came, came for her. And she also kind of struggled with some injuries too, as well. A little bit later in the career, I mean, she was, you know, in her, you know, mid to late twenties at this point. And she also talks about, you know, like how people thought that she was so old and as she was training to come back, that there would be younger skaters who were, you know, in high school that were making fun of her. Like, what are you doing here? Like, why are you coming back? And that eventually they would all leave and go on to other things and she would still be skating and she outlasted all of them. Right. And she knew that she was better than all of them. And so, I think that her comeback is certainly successful in the fact that she did make the comeback and she was, you know, one of the top 10 or 12 ladies in, in the U.S., but maybe she never reached those heights that she was in her younger days when she wasn't healthy and she didn't have a good support circle around her. And now she doesn't have to wonder what could have been if she didn't come back. And so, and 
most importantly, she rediscovered her love of figure skating and really found a healthy place with her self in the midst of it. So one thing that I, I neglected to talk about was the, the rape. She never specifies exactly when the rape occurred. It occurred during the 2016-2017 season, but she doesn't say exactly when nor after what event it happened. She talks briefly about the epic figure skating parties that would happen after events and after the galas where people would just let loose and there would be of alcohol, it sounds like. There would be damaged property at times. And so she wasn't clear, I think on purpose, so as not to give the identity away of her rapist, but it was someone that she was familiar with. And they do say that a lot of times that with sexual assault and rape, it is someone that the person knows. It's not usually an unknown person. And so, and she felt like the situation was complicated a bit because they had made out before. She was not interested in this person, but she knew that he had a crush on her. And so in their hotel room at an after party, things that sort of wind it down, Carly and her boyfriend had gone into another room and she was just left with this guy. And he's another skater. And they were he wasn't really getting the hint to leave. So she was like, well, and she was extremely drunk. And so she was like, well, help me let this bed out, this sofa bed out. So I have a place to sleep. And that's when the rape occurred. And after it happened, she like a lot, you hear a lot of rapist victims. They're, they're, they're not exactly sure that what just happened to them really did she felt like maybe she should go and report it to the local police department, but she felt like it would be a he said, she said situation and that she didn't have any evidence outside of the bloody sheets. She was a a virgin at the time. And this particular chapter is titled Innocence Lost, appropriately so. And she never told Carly, at least at the time, what had happened. I think part of it was she didn't want her sister to feel guilty because her sister was just right there I think also there's a a great deal of shame that happens in those type of situations. And so there was, it sort of built up a wall between her and Carly because she wasn't able to verbalize to her this very traumatic event that happened to her. And it happened in the same season that the wheels had come off. And so you can just see how difficult that it was for her in this 2016, 27 season, and also the season that followed. And and so all these years we've wondered what, what, what exactly happened to Gracie between the family life, between the rape, not telling anyone, there was just no way for her to really function. So at some point she did realize that she needed to report him. So she talked to a U.S. figure skating official about it. They said they were glad that they told her that they had to report it to Safe Sport, but nothing ever really came of that. And even as she was doing press for this book release, nothing had still ever come of that. And how frustrating for her that that has been. And and even how she could see with the situation with John Coughlin, how that came, those allegations came out and were published and, and hers never really kind of got anywhere. And why is it so much variance between the different cases and the concern of course that this skater could have done this to someone else and so it it's just it's heartbreaking when you think about it at any point in time but this is the worst really point in time and so i didn't mean to to miss that in the timeline of events that occurred because it was it's such an important piece of her history at that time And it's also very important when any survivor comes out to file a report about a sexual assault. So in the midst of this, she has, of course, grown leaps and bounds emotionally. And she, of course, is very upfront about struggles that, you know, that she still has, but that now if she's 
feeling a certain way, angry, sad, that she knows to take a time out to go in the bathroom for five minutes and calm down. She's got all these tools in her school box now, these coping mechanisms to help her in her journey sort of going forward. And so at some point she does meet a guy, and this is a, a cute story in the book. It's James Hernandez, who is partnered with Phoebe Becker and is an ice dancer for Great Britain. And they have been dating for some time. They live together. They have a dog together. And, and so that's a really sort of heartwarming piece of her story because she definitely talked about in the book when Carly goes off and goes to college and gets a boyfriend that she definitely feels left out of, of that that life that here she is still trying to be a skater and she's so focused on that goal and so closed off from just having a normal life. And so it seems like it, by the time that she ends the book that she's found her, her love for skating again, and she's been able to find love in her life as well. As far as her relationship with her parents, it's complicated because she has been able to have conversations with her mom about some of the issues that occurred that they didn't talk about over the years. She's chosen to not really have a relationship with her dad. Her dad reached out at different times and Gracie just felt like he, he was trying to get something out of her that it, he, I don't think she really felt like it was coming from an authentic place. And she's just not interested really in having a relationship with him at this point. And I can imagine that there's probably not a lot of respect there with the, with how he has treated their mother over the, the, the entirety of their, her life. And so, but she's also at peace with that, that she talks about in the book that James' father died at some point, And that was very hurtful for James to lose his father. And Gracie just sort of realized she didn't feel the same way that James kind of asked her the question, like, what if your father dies now and you guys haven't really patched this up? And she's like, I'm okay with that. Like I've come to peace with, with our relationship. And I think that that's, that's an, again, an important place to go because it, it means that it's not causing her any more pain, or at least if it is, then it's, it seems to be, it's no longer a, a huge stressor for her that she's really been able to work through a lot of those issues. So this book for me, I gave five stars. So I don't give a lot of books five stars. And it's my first five star read of the six books that I have read so far in 2024. I just, I'm a, I'm a big fan. I think I'm going to maybe listen to the audiobook again at some point. I pass it on to a family member who struggles with depression and I'm very interested to see what she gleans from the book. And I would love to hear thoughts from some of you as to what you thought about the book as well. And so that's my thoughts on it. And as always, thank you guys so much for listening to the podcast. And I'll be back soon with coverage of more figure skating events. You can find me on all the socials at Ice Skate Podcast. And that's also on YouTube and very active on X, less active on Instagram and threads, but I am there as well. You can also send me a line at thecuttingedge at gmail.com. Have a great week.